Βρισκόμαστε 50 χιλιόμετρα έξω από την πόλη του Μεξικού, στο Τεοτιουακάν, την πρωτεύουσα μιας αρχαίας αυτοκρατορίας, πίσω μας είναι η πυραμίδα του ήλιου. Ένα τόπο μαγικό, όπως και όλο το Μεξικό, που έχει αποτυπωθεί με τον ιδανικότερο τρόπο στο έργο του μεγαλύτερου συγγραφέα του Μεξικού, του Κάρλος Φουέντες. Αυτόν ήρθαμε να συναντήσουμε. Ο Φουέντες δεν είναι μόνο ένας από τους σπουδαιότερους συγγραφείς της εποχής μας, είναι και ο εθνικός, ας πούμε, συγγραφέας του Μεξικού. Είναι ο άνθρωπος που κατάφερε στο έργο του να συγκεράσει, να, να βάλει να συμβιώνουν οι δύο ψυχές του Μεξικού, η προϊσπανική και η ισπανική. Μιγάς ο ίδιος, όπως το 80% των Μεξικανών, κατάφερε να πιάσει τις αντιφάσεις αυτής της κοινωνίας, τα καλά της, τα κακά της, και να τα δώσει με έναν μοναδικό τρόπο, με μια μοναδική γλώσσα. Είναι ένας συγγραφέας γνωστός στην Ελλάδα, έχουν μεταφραστεί 13 βιβλία του και διάσημος φυσικά, έχει πάρει τα σπουδαιότερα βραβεία και το Νόμπελ της Ισπανόφωνης Λογοτεχνίας, το βραβείο Θερβάντες. Η συνάντηση μαζί του είναι μια ξέχαστη εμπειρία, όπως θα το διαπιστώσετε και οι ίδιοι. Καλό, ε. Και εξαιρετικό. Μάλλον. Όλοι οι συγγραφείς έχουν μια καταπληκτική σχέση με την τέχνη, τη ζωγραφική, φοβερή πίνακες. Να και ο ίδιος ο Φουέντες, σε προσωπογραφία. Μη φεύγεις από μακριά, μην απομακρύνεσαι. Carlos. <laughs> How are you? It's for you. Huh? How are you? But I'm not elegant at all. No, no, no. I will Good morning. Uh, I'm Michela This is Michela. Yes, Michela. Yes. <laughs> This is Dimitri, Saint <laughs> Apostolos. Good. I just not go up and put a tie on. No, 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 no. Huh? I can. Uh, yeah. I can take it off. You're always very informal. No, no. Yes, I am always informal. <laughs> But I said okay. Just in case it's coming, I'll be informal. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Uh, don't, do you, don't want? Don't you have uh, many photos, eh? I see. Yeah. There is Mitterrand. There is uh, Clinton. Clinton. Yes, yeah, so a lot of celebrities. This is from your. Uh, This is from life. I received the uh, Cervantes Prize. This is the Cervantes Prize. It's uh -huh. given me by the yes. king, and this is uh, a reception Clinton and Hillary gave. That's Sylvia and me. It was for the president of Colombia, so Garcia Marquez and I were invited. And this is when François Mitterrand gave me the Legion of Honor. Ah. Here uh, there is a photo with Arafat, I see. Yes, we received the same prize together. The same prize? Yeah. We received the Prince of Asturias prize. So we were sitting there together. And uh, this is Buñuel. Buñuel, uh, this is an excellent photo. Eh? Well, he's carrying the cross. <laughs> As usual, and uh, <laughs> this is a film called *The Milky Way*, which is about heresy. Mm. Yes, uh. this is a photograph of the presidential candidate Colosio, who was murdered. He was killed. 
as to why he was... Uh, Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. It's a big mystery. Mm -hmm. And here my wife and I engage with Buñuel. And here is... And uh, here is Garcia. Garcia Marquez, Carpentier, and myself. Three novelists. And what more do we have in the way of photographs? And here you have uh, Marcello Mastroianni. Here is my father giving a prize to Mastroianni. My father was ambassador in Rome. Uh -huh. Mastroianni got an actor's prize and gave it. Uh -huh. Here we are with Mrs. Allende, the widow of President Allende. Ah, uh, yes. And these are two photographs from my father, not from me, from Truman and Roosevelt. Uh -huh. I admire them both. I wouldn't say that of any president of recent years. <laughs> Maybe Clinton, yeah. My father was a diplomat, moved around a great deal throughout the American continent. I spent the school year in Washington, and then I came to school in Mexico from June to September. So I had two schools, two languages, and two visions of the world, the American vision of the Roosevelt era, the New Deal in the United States, and then of the era of Lazaro Cárdenas and the Mexican Revolution here. And they were complementary. And I felt at ease in both until one day, 1938, 18th March, 1938. I was very popular at my school in Washington. I appeared in plays. I wrote, eh, I was liked. I was a regular kid, as they say. On that date, 18th of March, 1938, our president, Lázaro Cárdenas, nationalized the oil wealth of Mexico. That day, I became a leper at school. I was branded an outsider, a communist, a horrible man. Something, somebody you should shun because of this act that was uh, described as robbery. It was only a recuperation of national wealth that had been in the hands of foreign exploiters. So that's how you became uh, politicized? I mean, you, so you know, I was the son of a diplomat in the years of the Mexican Revolution. And my father was there to defend the revolution, let us say to defend the agrarian laws, the nationalization of oil, all these things, that, <clears throat> the separation of church and state, all these things that were presented in the world as being horrible, this country of extreme violence and perturbation and per perpetual revolution, that was Mexico. So a diplomat had to defend the country against these things. And so I was very much conscious of the fact that I belonged to this country, that this country was criticized for its measures and uh, once uh, I went to see with my father a film called Man of Conquest. I was eight years old. And this uh, movie was about the independence of Texas, when Texas broke from Mexico. It was a biography of Sam Houston, after whom the city is named. And there came a moment in the film when I was only eight years old, I got up on the seats and screamed, Viva Mexico, que mueran los gringos. So I was taken out of the film by the house by my father, but that shows that I had a kind of nationalistic, patriotic conscience at a very early age. The first writings I did were uh, descriptions of Mexico, curiously, because I was outside of Mexico and I was asked to say, this country you come from, what is it like? So I wrote about Mexico. But then it was in Chile with a man who is now a very well-known philosopher, a Kantian philosopher, Roberto Torretti. We wrote a novel together. And this novel was very influenced by Dumas. We said if uh, a good novel has to be, begin in Marseille, but uh, he kept the manuscript. And now he has a version of the novel, which is not my version. And I say, but where is the novel? He said, it was in one of the trunks of my mother, and it disappeared. So we'll never know what we said. I remember that it began in Marseille, that uh, it had to do with a black dictator in Haiti uh, who lived on the top of a mountain with a mistress he uh, mistreated. This was Jane Eyre, of course. All our readings came forth. He says, it is, that's not true. It was another novel. He's wrong. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but your readings were not uh, mm -hmm. Latin American ones. Rather no, I, re I read, I read uh, Jules Verne. 
Dumas, Mark Twain, and Stevenson. Mm -hmm. I think these were the four writers of the early youth that really sprang to your, that really lit up your imagination. You think you have uh, today something? Uh, oh, absolutely. There's a love of narrative that is implicit. That's why they catch young readers, because they narrate. And uh, there's always an element of narrative. You go from it, you are nearer or uh, further from it as you write, but, it, but you cannot avoid the, the element of narrative that comes basically from the Count of Monte Cristo, the Vengeance, the Three Musketeers, uh, Mark Twain on the Mississippi, the little boy on the Mississippi, etc. These are images that never leave you. It's a beautiful house. It's built well, uh, during the 60s? Yes, it's a 60s house. Yeah. Very good architect. José Turbe. And that portrait of my mother is by Siqueiros. Uh -huh. By Siqueiros? Yeah, yeah. Ah. We were together in Chile. And he is the supporter of, of my mother. That's beautiful. Very beautiful woman. She was very beautiful. Yeah. My father was an agnostic. My mother was very Catholic. I went to uh, non-religious schools in Washington, in Chile. But then I arrived with my mother alone in Mexico, and she said, this is my opportunity, and she put me into Catholic school. <laughs> it was very fruitful, because I live in a country where even the atheists are Catholics. I have to take that into account. Everybody's a Catholic in Mexico. Everybody believes in the Virgin of Guadalupe, even if they're atheists. <laughs> I was first at the university in uh, Switzerland, and then I came to university in Mexico in 1951. When I came back, I was in a generation of the left, young left students in Mexico, so we were reading the classics of socialism, including Marx and many other writers. Yes. You started to publish when? I started, my first book I published in 54. 54. It was a book of short stories. My first novel, La Regiona Transparente, is 58. Because it was the first time that you had a city novel, in which the novelist's gaze turned to this metropolis and say, hey, we're not in the revolution anymore. We're in a post-revolutionary society, and this is what is happening. And these are the protagonists, and these are the realities told in a fictional way. While you have a, a cosmopolitan life and a cosmopolitan education, your novels and your works are m more Mexican than mm -hmm. cosmopolitan. John Dos Passos deals with the United States, and François Mauriac deals with France, and uh, uh, Alberto Moravia deals with Italy, and, you know, and Kazantzakis with Greece. You're, you're, you're placed in one. Uh, uh, you, not all of us can be Henry James who's a very true cosmopolitan. He could speak about Italy, set his novels in Italy or in Britain or in the United States. Uh, no, no, I'm rooted in Mexico. My imagination is here. My roots, my forebears are here. It all depends on uh, the accidents of birth. My grandfather was uh, a widow. He was uh, 40 years old. My grandmother was 18. And they fell in love and married and had three children. Uh, but the beginning of this story is right there in the state of Veracruz, which I consider my home state. I feel very linked to Veracruz. I love it very much. Like the people, it is a uh, contrast to the somber plateau where we are. Mexico City is rather somber, Aztec. Whereas there, it's the coast, it's gay, it's uh, full of music and sound and uh, voices. Mm? And uh, that's where my family comes from. I have, a, I have a deep in me, that, that origin in the Gulf Coast of Veracruz. Συνέχεια θα ταξιδέψουμε στην επαρχία της Βαρακρούς του Μεξικού για να αναζητήσουμε την καταγωγή του Φουέντες. 
Θα δούμε πώς η προγονή του παρισφρύουν στο έργο του, πώς επιβιώνει ακόμα ο πολιτισμός των Ιθαγενών Ινδιάνων και γιατί η θρηλυκή Μεξικανική Επανάσταση υπήρξε ένα από τα αγαπημένα θέματα του συγγραφέα. Οι ρίζες του Κάρλος Φουέντες αποτελούν πηγή έπνευση για το μυθιστόρημά του «Οι μέρες με τη Λάουρα Δίας», μια οικογενειακή σάγκα από την οποία δεν λείπουν οι αυτοβιογραφικές αναφορές. Εκεί θα συναντήσουμε την προγεγιά του συγγραφέα, Κλωτίλτε Βέλες, που έπεσε σε νέδρα ληστών στο Καμίνο Ρεάλ. Ο ληστής τη ζήτησε τα δακτυλίδια, εκείνη αρνήθηκε να τα δώσει και αυτός της έκοψε τα δάχτυλα με ένα ματσέτε. Από την άλλη μεριά, στο μυθιστόρημα εμπλέκεται και ο προπάπος του Φουέντες, Φίλιπ Μπέτιγκερ, ένθερμος σοσιαλιστής που άφησε τον Ντάρμστατ της Γερμανίας για να αναζητήσει τον δικό του παράδεισο στην επαρχία της Βερακρούς, ιδρύοντας μια μεγάλη καλλιέργεια καφέ. Εκεί μεγάλωσε η κόρη του Εμίλια, γιαγιά του συγγραφέα, και όταν έφτασε τα 18 επισκέφτηκε τη γιορτή της Ιπαπαντής στο χωριό Τλακοτάλπαν, όπου και συνάντησε τον παππού του. Σε αυτή τη γιορτή λοιπόν ήρθαμε κι εμείς, ακολουθώντας τα ίχνη της καταγωγής του Φουέντες και αναζητήσαμε στα πρόσωπα των λαϊκών ανθρώπων τον κόσμο της έμπνευσή του. sit at my table in the evening and say tomorrow I'm going to write this chapter I'm going to say these things and I go to bed peacefully because I know what I'm going to do I don't have the anguish of what I'm going to do the next day I go to sleep get up in the morning go to write and something I had never thought of comes out where does this come from what happened in dreams what other realities appeared that through my whole plan Askew. And this comes in the act of writing. You're instantly writing about things you had not thought of before. To come from a very mysterious pool of dream, experience, memory. What are you carrying with you? Are you alone? Are you representing others? Are you the mirror of those who preceded you? <clears throat> of your parents and grandparents and the generations? thousands of years before you, I don't know. of cultures and the fact that we have an Indian culture and a Spanish European culture and also a mestizo culture basically is what makes us very conflictive we cannot understand Mexico without the Indian part or the Spanish part yeah. we're a great mixture 80% of us are mestizo there's only 10% pure Indian and 10% pure white in Mexico so if we do not see ourselves as a mestizo culture we don't understand uh, ourselves our conflicts come from it but also the great things we have done The mestizo culture is what has given Mexico its personality. It's everywhere, it's in the music, it's in the painting, and the art, it's in the literature. Your books 
have a um, relation to history, but as a writer, isn't it a, a sort of prison to stick to the truth, to the, to the historical I'd truth? I'd never stick huh? to the truth, How and all historians you? tell me I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you invent things constantly. I'm not interested in history, I'm interested in something very specific, which is the point of meeting between the social event and the individual event where the individual crosses with the society and therefore with history, that is the point, the intersection of avenues that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in Artemio Cruz because he participated in the Mexican Revolution. He happens to have participated the same way that Fabricio del Dongo was at Waterloo and didn't realize it. Although so many characters in European novels are set in history, in a particular moment of history, but they are, go beyond the history or stay behind the history, I don't know. But the fact is that you are always within a social background. The theme of the Mexican Empire in 1910 appeared many times by Carlos Fuentes. In the Gero Gringo, who was also written in the cinematograph, Fuentes makes a hypothesis about what can happen to the cinematographer Ambrose Beers when he followed the Empire of Pancho Villa with the result of losing the Ichli. Ωστόσο, ο θάνατος του Αρτέμιο Κρούς παραμένει το δημοφιλέστερο βιβλίο του Φουέντες. Αναφέρεται στη ζωή ενός φανταστικού αξιωματικού της Μεξικανικής Επανάστασης που με το πέρασμα του χρόνου μετατρέπεται σε εκπρόσωπο του νέου κατεστημένου, έναν δυνάστη των φτωχών που δεν διστάζει να συνεργαστεί με τους ξένους κεφαλαιοκράτες και να καταστρατηγήσει όλες τις αρχές της νεότητάς του. The Mexican Revolution was a definitive date in the history of Mexico. It brought forth all the elements of our life that had been disguised by the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, who, like many other Latin American uh, leaders, thought that if we looked like Europe, we would progress like Europe. and forgot that half the country, at least, was living in poverty, in squalor, without education. And this is what came forth in the Mexican Revolution, saying, here we are, all of us. There's a great photograph of a Zapatista leader having coffee at a place called Sanborns, a very, the jockey club in Mexico, which was a very aristocratic place. And suddenly you have this man with this big straw hat, a rifle in his hand and a scar in his mustache in his face. He's there having breakfast at Sanborns, which means that a whole society has been topsy-turvy. So it was a great event that uh, defined the life of Mexico for the next century. Now we're coming into another era, but uh, during my youth, suddenly the presence of the Mexican Revolution was extremely important. And what had been written about the revolution were chronicles of the revolution, like the novels of Azuela and Guzman, or very nationalistic tracts that were not literature at all. And uh, you think that uh, the big success in all the world of this novel uh, it's, uh, it's this, it's, uh, this. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it has some literary merits. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> of course, the, the style. Yeah, the, the, the structure, the structure. Style. At this moment when I wrote it, the structure was a novelty. It was difficult for many people to read because they could not uh, think of first person, second person, third person, past, present, future, all mixed together. Uh, they were accustomed to a chronological novel. Yeah. I was born in such and I died in, in such. And you can play with the elements of time and space in a way that was totally revolutionary a century ago. Today is not revolutionary. What is revolutionary today? Let's think about it. Come on, Tails. Silvia, wait up. Vamos a filmar arriba. Aquí viene Anteos que quiere saludarte. Diego. You're ill. <laughs> bueno, I'm How are you? Eh? How are you? Fantastic. Would, would you open that door for me? Oh, yeah, this. Oh, yes. Because my doggy is there. I want him to come over. Oh, Minaka. 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 Si todas las mujeres que he querido se resumen en una sola, la única mujer que he querido para siempre las resume a todas las demás. 
Ellas son las estrellas, Silvia es la galaxia misma. Ella lo contiene todo, la belleza, el placer erótico, pero también el simple placer de estar juntos, sentarnos a comer, dormir y despertar, caminar, viajar juntos, compartir amigos, discutir dudas, hacer planes, entender defectos, aceptar errores, amarnos incluso por lo que podría irritarnos o disgustarnos en nuestras personalidades y conductas. La alegría de tener hijos, la pena de perderlos. La comunión de la memoria, el respeto de los tiempos, los diferentes gustos, la complementariedad de profesiones, intelectos, emociones. Somos distintos. Somos distintos y cada cual le da al otro lo que ya no le falta porque lo mío fluye hacia ella como lo de ella fluye hacia mí. Somos muy distintos físicamente. Ella es delicada, dueña chica, rubia y con unos ojos sensuales que cambian del azul al verde y al gris con las horas. Su aspecto es europeo, pero su piel es mate con un bello fulgor oriental. Su gusto por la ropa es extremo y me deleita. La quiero porque yo soy el hombre más puntual de la tierra y ella puntualmente siempre llega tarde. Es parte de su encanto, hacerse esperar. Los europeos del siglo XVII esperaban que la muerte les llegase de España para que les llegase tarde. No, a ella y a mí nos llegó temprano cuando perdimos a Carlos. Unidos desde siempre, llegó una muerte que nos unió más que nunca. Ella sabe mantener la presencia de Carlos a toda hora. Yo, menos sensible o más cobarde, he aprendido a convocar a mi hijo con una fuerza que a mí mismo me sorprende a la hora de escribir. Es cuando él está a mi lado, sintiendo que en mi esfuerzo cotidiano él cumple, de alguna manera, su destino trunco. Una pareja no sabe quién sobrevivirá al otro o si ambos morirán juntos, pero el que sobrevive será siempre, no un doliente, sino un delegado de la muerte. El amor que se delega en la muerte se llama Eros. Después de las noches, los días, los años de la carne contigua, su ausencia solo se suple mediante la imaginación erótica. Entender esto es intensificar al máximo la relación sexual en el presente y desbordarla eróticamente a todas y cada una de las horas que físicamente no regresarán. Pues no debe haber aún en el amor más pleno un anticipo de pérdida que intensifica la presencia actual. A veces, mirando dormir a Silvia, quisiera robarle el nombre, la apariencia, la experiencia y ser el dueño absoluto de su existencia, el guardián celoso de sus secretos. Todas las noches dejo una nota invisible sobre su almohada que dice, me gustas. Las mujeres son pasajeras del alba, cada una es portadora de un destino diferente. Mi destino fue encontrar a Silvia y convertir el mío en el suyo.